We're gonna move to sustainability. So we're gonna bring up Andre Pettigrew, who is the Executive Director of Clean Economy Solutions, a national platform to accelerate the growth of the clean economy through a coalition of regional chambers, economic development organizations, and business partners. So please welcome Andre Pettigrew. Good afternoon. Great. But once again, this is my first opportunity to be at an Abe conference. I'm an Abe member. Uh, but uh, I attend a lot of energy conferences uh, around the country, particularly around clean energy and renewables. And these conferences don't look like this conference. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I recognize in this sector is that our community, communities of color, the African American community is very much underrepresented. And from my work, uh, I just feel that it's a, a great opportunity. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Paula on putting together a great conference. I've learned a lot. The speakers have been right on point. Um, I also uh, want to commend Abe for be, being willing to sort of take on these issues. Now, Abe is 37 years old, uh, and if you think about the things that have happened, not in the energy sector, but in our economies in those 37 years, and I think they're relevant to, to what I want to talk about today. So in the 37 years that Abe's been around, um, centralized computing has been completely dismantled. I'm talking about mainframe computing. Uh, to a much more distributive model. Every one of you have a computer on your hip that was probably more powerful than the computer that I uh, was working with when I was a student at UCLA. In 1980, the telecommunications industry, uh, the baby bells were broken up into baby bells. Uh, and once again, that wasn't the end of the world, but that was the end of uh, one choice for a phone, and that was black and a dial. And so now we have a proliferation of mobile phones and what have you. In the media industry, uh, we had three stations when I was a kid, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Uh, through multimedia, uh, we literally have hundreds of media to choose from, and now we have multiple mediums to use it in. And so if we knew now what we should have known back then, our life would have been different. But the energy industry is essentially having a similar effect. But the great news is that there is an Abe. Uh, Abe has been here for 37 years uh, tracking the energy industry, tracking environmental justice, tracking jobs and economic opportunity. And to me, you were ahead of your time, but this is now your time. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about our organization. Uh, we're a nonprofit. We're principally funded by the Rockefeller Brothers. For the last seven years, we've been out delivering uh, what we call a prosperity message in climate change. That's the economic message that you heard from a number of speakers. That message really is about how energy efficiency, alternative energy, uh, all of the things that were discussed a little bit from the prior speaker are creating new opportunities. The simplest way to put this is Saving the planet now makes dollars and cents. So the environmental reason for saving the planet is always important because we don't have a planet B. But there are more people and more people of color who are embracing the environmental movement because they see this as an economic opportunity, a job opportunity. And thus, millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, are being made because people are now committed to change their behavior and improve the economy. So the first shout out or change maker that I want to give out, I want to give a shout out to our president. So the whole notion of sustainability has been redefined uh, by the president. So in 2008, when President Obama signed the stimulus bill, it was the first time the economic recovery, climate change, and clean energy were combined. The $800 billion stimulus bill had $80 billion that were specifically linked to clean energy and things related to clean energy. Uh, it actually accelerated this whole notion of uh, wind, solar, renewables in a way that had never been done before. In addition to that, as a part of public policy, the Sustainable Community uh, Program 
which is a partnership between EPA, uh, Department of Energy and Transportation, and HUD, essentially created a whole new format for discussing sustainability. There are 140 plus communities who receive planning grants to begin to talk about something called sustainability, clean energy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in essence, the stimulus bill essentially moves the discussion of energy and sustainability out into communities uh, where people could touch and see it as opposed to just what's happening in the White House. Uh, you heard from DOE, the DOE, Minorities in, Ener in, in Energy Enterprise, is a very important one because the national labs are an important resource in communities uh, dealing with uh, the research, the development. We talked about access to some of the new technologies that are there. Uh, that is real and available and local. So you don't have to come to Washington, D.C. to get that. So my job is essentially to try to set the table uh, for tomorrow's panel. I'm going to give a quick overview of the advanced energy economy. Uh, the operational framework is complicated. Uh, uh, the uh, previous speaker, Colette Honorable, had talked about some of the intricacies of public policy that's a part of it. And then I'm going to suggest a leadership opportunity for aid. So the U.S. advanced energy economy. So this is a very important quote. So this is Thomas Edison, the father of the, the modern electricity system. There are many people who say that if he came back today, he'd still know how to operate it. This is a conversation uh, this quote came from a conversation where Edison was talking to Goodyear, that's Goodyear Tire, Henry Ford, and the only person who was missing in the room was J.D. Rockefeller. And the punchline is simply this. Eighty years ago, uh, the father of electricity, our modern utility system, asked the question, are we going to have to wait for us to run out of coal and oil before we pursue what's readily available and, and, and naturally available here. That's wind and solar, and he's making that bet. And literally today, that still is a question that's being asked in this sector. The advanced energy economy is real. It is a trillion dollar market opportunity for American companies globally. Now, most people aren't floored by the trillion. In fact, they say, well, you know, where does that number come from? Uh, the advanced energy uh, Economy Association, which is made up of a number of business leaders, just recently did a, a joint study with Navigant. Navigant Research is a research company. Uh, the global uh, alternative energy or renewable energy sector is $1.13 trillion. That's a big number, but then when you realize that the entire energy industry is over $6 trillion, it's still relatively small. This is less than 20% of the industry. But yet, uh, as the previous speaker, the earlier speaker said, the only thing bigger than the energy industry is the money industry. And so to me, being able to participate in this roughly 20% of an emerging sector, I think is a huge opportunity for us. What's happening in this sector is, uh, it's clean energy is in fact being disruptive. So the energy mix is changing. Uh, this is not about you know, living uh, and operating in a world in which there is no coal, in which there are no fossil fuels. For everyone in this room, there will be fossil fuels in the energy mix. However, the ability to begin to offload or you know, onboard solar, wind, biofuels, uh, electric vehicles, intermittent energy is a challenge. First of all, it challenges the traditional utility business model. Uh, they're all regulated utilities. Uh, uh, working with the Public Utility Commission, uh, they have to apply for their ability to sort of uh, develop, distribute uh, energy as a part of it. Uh, that's how our system has worked. Um, I don't think anyone uh, in the world, or at least in this country, would be willing to have a purely competitive market-driven uh, energy or water system because if the highest price paid, there will be a lot of poor folks who would not have energy and would not have water. And so the regulation part of this is really an important piece of, of the work. But as that mix changes, there are legitimate questions. So will the technology work? How do we put it on the grid? Who's going to pay? Um, you know, and, and then access to the customer. 
who has access to the customer? Right now, there's a huge battle going on around Smart Grid in terms of who has access to the interior of the household. That's why a number of cable companies and other sort of you know, service providers are very much into the meter, smart metering business. Because once they get inside that home, you can begin to sell a whole host of different services. But nonetheless, it's a part of the advanced energy system. Um, so the bottom line from my standpoint is, just like in those other sectors that I talked about, telecommunications, computing, and media, this sector is changing. And based on that change, there is a whole host of opportunities. So just seven, maybe 10 years ago, there was a big discussion about what is this thing called green, the green economy or green jobs? And quite frankly, those were hard questions to ask because the, the industry in itself was just developing and just beginning to mature. But since that time, there have been a number of studies and a number of organizations that have tried to uh, put some granularity to what we mean when we talk about the advanced energy or clean economy uh, ecosystem. This is a, an ecosystem as developed by the Clean Tech Group, which is an investment group out of Silicon Valley that tracks the industry. I'm not gonna go through all of these, and I, I hope you can see them, but here again, I'm going to speak to a couple of you. You heard energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is, is, is an opportunity that exists in every community. Right now, public utilities, as a part of their demand side management programs, are spending $7 billion to help reduce energy consumption, both commercial and residential. Once again, tons of economic opportunity. If you're an energy auditor, if you're a contractor, if you're an architect engineer, because that's a part of the program. Wind is something that we're, you know, more familiar with, the wind turbines. Uh, I have spent a lot of time in Colorado. I used to be the head of economic development for the city and county of Denver. Uh, Colorado uh, has been very successful in attracting wind and solar companies as a part of it. For us, the strategy is very simple. Uh, these technologies are, are really growing and, and, and are driving a lot of investment and potential. We have wind, we have sun, but we're also top five, top 10 in natural gas, oil, and coal. And once again, our civic leaders, our elected officials chose to manage a portfolio of energy and not so much be held hostage by the traditional fossil fuel energies that the energy mix is what all of us want to try to have and be a part of. Us, you know, so, Smart grid is another one of the, the areas that I think is really important. I talked a little bit about uh, what's happening there. This is an area where few people are debating whether we need to make the electric grid system two-way. Right now, it's pretty much one way, that if we can have two-way communications using software and other information technology pieces, the internet, uh, it will make the system work that much more efficient uh, it will save money, it will essentially eliminate brownouts, and once again, that's a multi-billion dollar investment. And granted, the question is, who's going to pay? But the other question is, who's going to take advantage of the opportunity to benefit in it? One of the things that I realize about the energy sector and the work that I do, that it really is very complex uh, and, 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 and very difficult to, to, to manage. And so I'm a firm believer, and I'm going to say it here today and make this bold statement, that America's clean economy will have to go through Abe and its members. Um, once again, some of the future entrepreneurs, service providers, and innovators are in this room today. And that opportunity will happen because you know energy. Clean energy is not separate and apart from traditional energy. It's just a subset, and so a lot of the same things that are required to, to, to develop and deliver energy will also be required in clean energy. So if I wasn't at today's conference, I would have been in New York at the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Conference. I attended it last year, and this is just a screenshot of who's there. It's a diverse crowd who are tracking what's going on in the energy sector 
with a heavy emphasis on what's going on in the clean renewable sector. Uh, they essentially just released their report on Monday uh, that basically showed that uh, essentially the investment, the global investment in the clean renewable sector is $214 billion. It's actually declining. It's declined twice uh, in the last two years, 14%. Uh, and what's important about that number is that there are a lot of things happening there. VC investment in the sector is declining. However, corporate investments, uh, strategic corporate investments are going up. They're going up because there are some of the, the technologies that are now ready for market and are less risky. And so through mergers and acquisitions, they are acquiring them. Uh, I think the other thing that is important is that renew the cost for renewable industry, industry, energy is going down. The cost to deploy renewable energy is going down. Uh, for example, in the United States, uh, the cost to install solar is in fact down 60%. And you can remember back in Solyndra, there was a big debate about Chinese-made panels and what that was going to do. Uh, the, 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 uh, the truth of the matter is, is that the cost of installation has gone down. Um, there's tons of information out here. Uh, this is ACOR, the, uh, the uh, American Council for Renewable Energy, and the Pew Charitable Trust, who have both just released studies this month on the industry, and I suggest that you get the facts through that sort of thing. Uh, this is a screenshot in terms of how they are tracking each industry, excuse me, each country in terms of that investment. There's so much going on that it's important that you have the most current and the right information in order to, to play in this sector. So once again, the operational framework, very quickly here. Market diversification, policy uncertainties, technical advances, and adoption patterns. This is the complexity of the industry. Um, basically, policymakers at the state level uh, are setting new standards for advanced industri industry, uh, you know, Clean Air Act, and things of that nature. The market signals are represented by renewable portfolio standards and energy efficiency standards. These standards have effectively carved out and are requiring utilities to pay uh, to use a portion of their energy generation funds to use renewables, wind and solar. It is very important in these carve outs because they're sending a market signal to achieve the policy goal. Uh, the tapping of innovation and capital formation is key to this because without markets, investments aren't made. Uh, the federal labs again are playing a big role here. And a whole new set of tool boxes, a toolbox is being developed. Uh, power purchase agreements, on, uh, on board financing, on bill financing, and other things of this nature are all evolving. We are very early in this process. Once again, public utilities, $100 billion a year are being decided in terms of how energy is invested. That affects our community, that affects you as business people. Uh, it's worthwhile going to this site and tracking what's going on in your state. Uh, so here's my leadership opportunity. I've said that I believe that the success of America's clean energy future will drive through uh, this organization uh, because of your background and skills. So building on the success of what's going on right now. So our country's shared desire for energy independence, security, and innovation is driving a whole new set of innovations, investments, and entrepreneurships. The early adopters, the early adopters and innovators are the ones who are driving this transition. And we are in a transition period. We have just begun what will be a transformation. There are a whole host of new business models that are evolving and develops. So how do you come up with the right sets of financing securities, loan programs, equity investments around this sort of thing? In energy, price always matters, but there are more customers who want clean, dependable, reliable, clean energy. And I'll just name a few. Apple, Google, uh, and Amazon. These are some of the biggest companies in the country who are committed to 100% renewables as a part of their program. And so, once again, these are real opportunities. So here's Abe's call to action. So most of the folks in our community aren't really aware of what's going on. And so I'm suggesting that part of Abe's agenda, and I think this is consistent with your mission, uh, and that is to 
once again, establish today's baseline for clean energy. Uh, if we use Obama's commitment in 2008 as the start, so what has the impact been in our communities around clean energy? Uh, has it, in fact, improved the quality of life uh, uh, for our community when it comes to clean air? Uh, the closing of uh, the coal fire plants to natural gas, what is the impact? So establishing that with the facts is really important. I think Abe is appropriately positioned to create a vision. Uh, the work that we do around the country are with the traditional economic development organizations, and every one of them are, in fact, creating a vision for their community around clean energy. Accelerate advocacy and inclusion. This is a wealth creation opportunity that's going on out there. First of all, energy efficiency, uh, being able to reduce the cost of energy in a household, regardless of the income, is putting money in people's pockets, rich and poor. But rest assured, the new developers, the people who are the systems integrators, who are putting together the wind deals, the solar deals, are in fact creating new wealth opportunities as a part of their work. Clean energy is catalytic. STEM education was spoken about earlier today, but kids want to see themselves in jobs in which STEM education is a part of it. And I think the clean energy economy is going to get our kids excited faster than the traditional, though we need jobs in both sectors. Um, so let me, this is my background, um, contact information. Uh, we're on Facebook, we tweet, you can follow us. And then the final thing, and I know we're gonna have questions, and this is the ultimate question. Do we have to wait till coal and oil run out before we pursue this opportunity? Thank you. Um, I'm gonna bring up Bill Frank. Uh, and he is the general manager for business development and commercial for Chevron North America Exploration and Production. Um, Bill started his career as a drilling rep, and uh, he's been in uh, commercial transactions around the globe. So without further ado, I'll build, bring up Bill Frank. Good afternoon. I'm uh, delighted and humbled to be here. I realize I'm standing between you and your evening, uh, so... We'll get right to it. Uh, hey, I'm an engineer. Uh, I got interested in what is called uh, STEM uh, back in the 60s through the space program. And, uh, but all my uh, childhood heroes were, were baseball players, uh, Bob Gibson and Lou Brock. And I'm a diehard Cardinals fan. Turns out that uh, Colette is as well. So life is good. Um, so I'm an engineer, so I'm going to give you data. And uh, they asked me to talk about what's changed, all the game changers in the oil and gas space in uh, North America or more specifically in the U.S. It was kind of like, well, where do you start? Um, I've been around the world in my career with Chevron over 30 years now, uh, Europe, West Africa, Australia, different parts of the U.S. And the last time I was gone for 10 years, when I came back in 2008, I almost didn't recognize the place. Uh, how much change has happened. So I'm just going to give you some vignettes and some snapshots of uh, what's already uh, happening, if I may. Um, so first uh, chart here, I just want to draw your attention to the right-hand side. That's the, uh, the, the gas reserves. And way down there in the corner, there's a, a little shaded part called proved reserves. And let's call that, uh, I won't make you read it off the chart, call it 350 trillion cubic feet. Well, what does that mean? Well, proved reserves means that we have a 90% confidence level that we know where it is. We know how the wells will produce. We have permits. We have commitments. We have infrastructure. And we have money to uh, uh, d develop those uh, resources, those reserves. 350 trillion cubic feet, what does that mean? Well, today's consumption of natural gas total in the U.S., that's 12 years of supply. And that's about right, because the proved reserves, you can only forecast them out a few years. But think about it a different way. If all residential power was generated from natural gas, 
Okay, that, I know that's heresy, but just imagine if all of it came from natural gas, that 350 is enough for 60 years. Now we all know that only about a quarter of power comes from natural gas. King Coal is still king of that market. So that's a lot of gas. And uh, it, uh, we know where it is and the infrastructure is in place and it's uh, very, very scalable. The uh, chart on the left, uh, the bars there are on the oil side and they're um, frankly out of date. So I've given you data that's out of date. But I wanted to show you there that the, the USGS and uh, is frantically trying to update this because they know things have moved on. Um, by the way, if you hear someone say we have as much oil in Utah as Saudi Arabia, um, don't necessarily believe it. It's probably a politician talking and they're probably from Utah. <laughs> Just a little insider tip there. Um, but it really is a, a tremendous renaissance. So just building on the gas theme, uh, back in 2005, a very you know, um, respected organization, CIRA, you know, they all, a lot of people do forecasts. Well, that yellow line is what they were forecasting for natural gas production from the lower 48 United States, dead flat. And uh, there's still a lot of work to do to, to keep that flat. Well, they were a bit wrong. The, the gray line is what actually has happened since then. And green is their forecast from last year. That's pretty amazing. Um, but what's even more amazing is my little sound bite up there. We've actually moved from being supply constrained to being demand constrained in the natural gas market. Now talk about a game changer. So that means before it was, how are we gonna build LNG import terminals to bring gas from around the world into the US just to uh, you know, keep our homes warm and uh, generate a little bit of power with, uh, you know, to fill in the gaps between coal and nuke? Well, now it's demand constrained. So you mean that all those buses and trash trucks that go back to a central depot every night we could switch them from burning diesel to either, you know, compressed natural gas. Yep. Um, the, the mind boggles at the opportunities there when you're not supply limited anymore. And of course, gas from shale is the predominant uh, contributor to that increase. Flipping to the oil side for a moment, uh, anybody that's around here, you know, doesn't have to be told what's, what's going on. Um, Texas oil production has doubled between 2010 and 13. Obviously the Eagleford Shale south of San Antonio is the big contributor there. Colorado almost 90, you know, almost doubled in the same period. That's the Niobrara Shale, the northeastern part of the state. Good old Oklahoma, 60% increase. This is all what's already happened. And of course, the Permian Basin straddling West Texas and Southeast New Mexico, I can tell you, is only just beginning to be uh, understood in this new horizon of, of tide oil. Um, it was interesting, though, I was just reading an article last week about how this, um, the impact in local communities and how even indirect employment is impacted positively in terms of just measuring wages. Um, not, you don't have to be working for a Chevron or a drilling company or a pipeline company. You can be a school teacher or a, um, a restaurant owner or whatever. Uh, just in the community, there's a rising tide lifts all boats phenomenon. Uh, it's an interesting article. It was just Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, data at the county level. On the oil thing, again, um, I went to college during the Jimmy Carter era of, you know, we're running out of everything. Uh, put your sweater on, uh, adjust your thermostat accordingly. Um, and, and more recently, I think there was some, um, there, there's legitimate uh, energy, if you will, around, well, if I don't use the gasoline, then we're not importing oil from, from 
from bad people. Well, again, these are just the facts, the boring facts. This is actually where U.S. oil imports were coming from in 2005 and where they came from last year. You'll notice that Canada has actually increased uh, as their production from the oil sands uh, has in, uh, increased dramatically. And by the way, oil sands is not all mining. There's an awful lot of oil sands production that just looks like any other oil field. Um, but look at some of the others. Mexico and Venezuela down. Some, most of that is self-inflicted. They just have not been able to uh, produce as much for a variety of reasons. Uh, further to the right, Nigeria, Angola. Um, I worked in Nigeria for a while, love those people, love that country. Uh, so many challenges, so many opportunities. But uh, their oil is mostly going to Europe. Uh, their production's been, uh, been flat, Angola's increased. And then you can see the rest of the world just, we just, it's just way down. And I think countries, some of those bad people we talk about uh, in certain countries are in that rest of the world category. So that's where our oil actually comes from. So kind of what's the prize of all this? Um, I, we've been talking about entrepreneurship and, and opportunities. Um, I, I see it in three big buckets, and that's jobs, economic development, and affordable energy. Um, I mean, it basically it underpins everything. Um, the industry is is 8% of the US GDP. That's a dated number, that's 2011. And uh, you know, the economy is not terribly exciting. It, it, and you know that the, the oil and gas sector has increased, so um, it, it just makes you wonder what it would be like without it. It's a kind of a scary thought. Um, so three buckets, jobs, economic development, and affordable energy. Let's talk about jobs. 6% um, of the US employment is in the oil and gas. That's direct employment. Um, average job is double the national average. I don't think that's a secret to anybody. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get this message through to my kids <laughs> who are both in their 20s and they just, they just weren't excited about the, uh, the technical stuff. So uh, they're pursuing their dreams. This one really shocked me. New jobs in the oil and gas industry have increased 270,000 over that period. That's a 90% increase in new jobs, not total jobs. So what we're saying here is that the rate of job creation is 30 times the national average. Um, and trust me, we've, we've seen it firsthand, um, uh, trying to get uh, good people in all segments of the business is a continuing challenge. And so um, I wish I had been more persuasive with my kids. Economic development, um, capital investment. I mean, I'm not here representing Chevron. I'm just a guy who's worked in this business for a long time. But just Chevron alone has tripled uh, investments in the U.S. in the last 10 years. Now, what is I mean, capital investment? That's not our operating budget, you know, payroll expenses. Um, the, the multiplier effect of these is, is huge and well documented. Um, Chevron is a corporation. It's a $40 billion budget this year. Manufacturers are investing. Um, there's, there's so much going on. And then remember also that when the industry makes money, it's good for everybody. My dad was a union electrician his whole life. He's now uh, sadly in a, in a full-time nursing home. And uh, you know his, his pension and his social security wasn't enough. But his pension's important. And the dividends that companies like Chevron pay into mutual funds, that's that's where a lot of that money is going, is into investors in mutual funds, which is a lot of our pension plans, our 401ks, uh, our teacher retirement fund, firefighter retirement funds. Uh, companies paying dividends is a good thing. And I can remember, Warner, I know you can too, times when Chevron had to borrow money to pay the dividend. Um, and and that, that the, the commitment to that is very high. I heard somebody praising Apple Great company, love their products. They didn't pay a dividend to those shareholders until very recently. 
And also, did you know they, they didn't have an employee gift matching program until Steve Jobs died? He had to get out of the way before Apple had a, am I, are you kidding me? Every employer of any stature has a program to match their employees' gifts to charities. Anyway, I digress. Balance of trade. <laughs> so what about balance of trade? Well, I've lived around the world enough to know balance of trade matters. You cannot keep impoverishing a, a country either by printing money or by importing more than you export. So this is just one example. This is simply the value of petroleum products being exported over the last several years here. Okay, so this is refined. You can't export crude oil from the U.S. by law still, so, but you can export gasoline, jet fuel, diesel fuel, whatever. The value of those has increased from a billion to 12 billion a month in the last 10 years. By the way, don't even think about what the U.S. Uh, export deficit is per month. It'll really scare you. It's a huge number compared to this. But that 12 billion a month or 11 billion change, that's worth $1,000 to every U.S. worker annually that they're not borrowing, if you will, from overseas. And the other th question that this begs is why are we why are we paying for ethanol subsidies with tax do taxpayer dollars when there's a surplus of gasoline? Things have changed, and we don't always keep up with the change. Uh, taxes, the prize. Taxes, that sounds like an oxymoron. Um, taxes are usually not a prize, but um, it's a, you know, the most heavily taxed industry, 44% effective rate in the last four years. Um, and again, uh, speaking for Chevron, every time we, our profits equal our capital investment, it's all going back into the business and back into, uh, uh, when we do projects in the U.S., the U.S. content is typically 90 plus percent. It's all local. Um, there's 85 million a day going in just to the federal treasury. Obviously, the state and local level, there's a lot more. Uh, and you know, going into royalties and bonus payments and whatnot. Okay, this is my favorite one. Affordable energy, you know, the old adage about energy, what does that mean? It means, at the very basic level, it means light. Um, it used to mean light, heat, and mobility, right? And you've heard that phrase? Well, I guess in Houston we say light, comfort, and mobility. Um, we're not usually looking for heat. But this is the data on natural gas prices. The, uh, the, the blue is, uh, call it uh, Japan, uh, basically the Far East. Red is a proxy for Europe, which is all in the news now with Russia holding Ukraine hostage with natural gas. And the green is the good old US of A. And you can see from the first half of that chart, a lot of volatility, but they're kind of tracking each other, give or take. And for, I know for a fact that volatility scared a lot of power generators from basically getting married to natural gas, and perhaps quite rightly. Well, then the curves diverge, you can see, and you can see when that happened. It's about six months after I got back to the U.S. So, no, that's, that's the shale gale. That's shale gas being unleashed into the market at much lower cost. And so here we are now, $4 and change is probably not sustainable, but even if you add a dollar or $2 to that price, you see the price advantage that we have against the rest of the world. That matters. It, it's not just about, by the way, you should ask your utility company, how soon do I get to see the benefit of that in my, my bill? But it matters to petrochemical companies, it matters to, uh, it matters to FedEx, right? Uh, it, you know, so the, the cost of your overnight shipment uh, for, you know, grandma's birthday gift that you forgot to order ahead of time, you know, it, it matters to everything, uh, the fact that we have this advantage. And we're, we already have that advantage also on the oil side. And uh, again, having lived around the world and seeing how uh, crushing high energy costs can be across an economy, uh, and, and, uh, across countries is, is sobering. 
And again, just remember that uh, last year, uh, power generation in the U.S. it was 27 percent natural gas fired. It's a lot of a lot of room to grow there. So, what does it take for this to happen? Um, infrastructure, a lot of this gas and oil that we're finding a ways to unlock is in different places than it used to be. So there's a lot of infrastructure challenges and that's creating a lot of opportunity for people. You heard a lot about uh, uh, regulation uh, in earlier talks. Um, everybody wants effective regulation. One more little sidebar. Okay, I was a Boy Scout when I was a kid. <laughs> and there was a little adage whenever we went camping that was beat into us and I, I, and I, um, I embraced it. Um, and it was leave it better than you found it. And uh, so in my family, I'm the, I'm the recycling Nazi, uh, uh, in not, not just my immediate family, my extended family. Oh, well, Bill's here, you better put your aluminum cans off to one side. That's right. Leave it better than you found it. And, and, and that's been my approach to my job, is I've been around the world solving problems about how to get this stuff out of the ground. It's not at any cost. It, it, I want, it's got to be better than when we got there. And, uh, and I'm proud to say that the, the company I work for, it, it's, this stuff is not a priority, it's a value. It's, it's a, it's a non-negotiable. But not everybody has those intrinsic values, so you've got to have regulation to raise the bar and to hold people accountable. And as long as those regulations are effective and predictable, um, it's a win-win. And then finally, of course, free markets, that old adage, um, you know, if markets will find, um, will find a way uh, to get the lowest cost, cleanest, and uh, sustainable energy to the consumer. Um, my boss's boss's boss is your, one of your speakers tomorrow. And uh, keep your ear open. He's got a couple of mentions of Germany in there. And I would just encourage you to take a look at Germany as an experiment in a lot of the things that are being discussed in terms of the uh, uh, mandates and uh, renewables and, and uh, other policy measures. So they're further down that track and just look to them for the sort of pretty substantial unintended consequences that they're now having to deal with. And it's, uh, you know, and they're not, they're not, they're not stupid people. Uh, these, these are all well-intentioned objectives, but the world's, world's changed. These are just a few of the game changers in, in my world as an oil and gas guy. So Paul is going to come up and, uh, and close out the day for us. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, here's Paula Jackson. So day one, what do you guys think? You guys all right? Okay. Uh, some of you who know me will notice that I have changed my shoes because now the fun part is going to start. Um, in about an hour downstairs, buses will leave for our chairman's reception where we're going to be honoring um, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, um, who has been a very longtime supporter of the association, a founding member of the Houston chapter, and a former A board member. Um, so I encourage you all to have a really great time at that reception. We have a hospitality suite up on the 24th floor that I believe opens at about 9.30 and will run until whenever you all decide to go home. Um, and we'll have light refreshments there as well as a DJ. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I know I am not as young as I used to be. So I'm not gonna hang with you all night long um, because we do need you to be here tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. to hear John Watson, um, to hear Bob Powers, to enjoy our conversation of the C-suite. Um, we've got a very full day planned for tomorrow, um, and I know that you will find it very much worth your while. Um, so you have 55 minutes to roam and be free, and then our buses will start leaving in the lobby level. Thank you for being here. See you soon. <laughs>